Welcome, everybody, to Omega Author Talks. My name is Mike Rivera. I am the executive advisor to Omega Consulting. I will be your moderator today. We are talking with co-authors of Six Path to Leadership, Meredith Persley Lamel. Uh, she's the CEO of Aspire at Work and provides executive and team coaching for C-suite corporate and nonprofit leaders. Dr. Mark Clark, who is an associate professor and chair at the Department of Management at Kogog School of Business in Washington, D.C. Again, welcome to Omega Talks. Let's get started. I purchased this book called Six Paths to Leadership, and I was just curious about it, and I began to peruse through it, and I was reading it, and I saw these six things that you wrote down, insider, outsider, representative, uh, proxy, creator, legacy, and I just dove right into the book. And um, and I, as I was reading it, this question kept popping in the back of my head. What inspired you both to get together and write Six Path to Leadership? So, you know, Mark and I have both been um, you know, students and professors of leadership, um, as well as practitioners, you know, providing um, leadership coaching and consulting to all different types of organizations for, you know, for a few decades now. And um, one of the things that, um, that became clear to me in my work with leaders, especially around onboarding of leaders. So, you know, how to set up leaders for success in the first few months of um, a new leadership position was that a lot, of the, um, a lot of the guidance out there was being universally applied to all different types of leaders. And um, having worked with, with leaders in multiple different contexts, um, and when we think about context, we might think about different industry contexts. But mm -hmm. um, in, in, in my case, I started thinking about it in terms of how people assume their leadership position or the path they took into their leadership position. And I have the privilege of working with elected leaders, um, entrepreneurs, you know, corporate leaders who are kind of moving up in the ranks. Um, and I was noticing that the onboarding programs, the guidance, again, was the same regardless of that path. Mm. And yet the challenges were actually quite different. And perhaps even more importantly, the advantages of each of those paths were different. And that it was really important to make a contribution to the field to differentiate between those different paths so that we could better customize um, those onboarding experiences for leaders um, depending on their path. And Mark and I, um, as colleagues at American, um, I went and talked with him about this idea, um, knowing that, um, that if I could bring his expertise and his um, um, approach to research um, and combine that with a lot of the work that I was doing on the ground with leaders, um, that together we could really produce something um, that hopefully is a great contribution to the field. Absolutely. Um, Meredith and I both have varied backgrounds in our own careers and with the folks that we've worked with. So this means we've seen leadership operate in the public sector. We've seen it operate in not-for-profit organizations. We've seen it operate in the corporate world, right? And we've both been managers and we've both been trainers and we've both been consultants. I went the academic route uh, uh, a little earlier probably than Meredith, which means that I spent some time studying the research literature and saying, well, what do we know about leaders and leadership? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is we know quite a lot because of course people have been interested in how people influence those around them for thousands of years. And our take on it is that we want to keep all of that great knowledge and information about how people exhibit different traits or how they learn skills and they apply them, how they have particular behaviors that might work better in one situation uh, than another. But what we add then is, as Meredith was talking about, this understanding of context, which really hasn't been 
looked at. And the easy probably way to think of it is the example that she gave. If you're looking at an elected politician or even an appointed public servant, you probably are going to have some different opportunities and some different challenges than someone who is going upwards within an organization or who's coming into a corporate organization from the outside, much less a creator, right? Someone who's founding an organization, your, your typical entrepreneur, or your legacy family leader, who's somebody who is not given leadership, but instead they uh, get an opportunity to extend that family legacy, which is more than just the business. So when we think of what our value add is, we think that it's that we're talking about the differences in these different contexts along these six different paths, but then also thinking about, well, then what is the same? What is similar that we could learn from one type of leader, one path of leadership to another? Yeah, that was a question that was running through my head. What is the, the common thread throughout each one? Uh, is there a common thread? You know, to uh, look at our first chapter in our book, which I'm sure that, that you have, Mike, but everyone else hasn't had a chance to yet. You would see that we actually found themes that we pulled out across the six paths. And they include things like, you know, everyone's going to have a mission and a vision. There's going to be a, a, a culture. There's going to be differentiation on passion. So there's a lot of these themes that come out across the different paths, but then the leaders within those paths have to differentiate how they enact culture or how they bring their passion or whose mission and vision is it in the first place. Mm. So even mm. among the commonalities, there are differences according to the paths. Yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, that's kind of where the fun is, right? Is that um, that we take something like credibility, right? For a leader to be effective, they have to um, have some credibility with their followers, but where do they get that credibility from? And so like on the outsider path, that credibility usually comes from bringing a skill set or an experience that doesn't exist internally in the organization. So they have to go from the outside to pull in that credibility. And it's usually through a, a competitive process, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then promoted from within, um, your credibility comes from your reputation that you've built in over time. Um, and that people know you, you're a known entity, you know the culture, right? So that's where your credibility comes from. As an appointed leader, your credibility comes from the power of the principal who appointed you, right? The elected, it comes from the constituency, from the democratic process of being elected. That's where your credibility comes from, right? So it's, again, it's the theme like Mark discussed, but the but there's a tweak by path. And so it's really important for you to recognize that, um, you know, um, if you've been promoted from within for a period of time, right, and your credibility comes from that track record, but now you're coming in from the outside, um, how do you sort of represent that credibility in a, in a new way? Because this is the first time people are meeting you. What are some of the challenges that you have find, or pros and cons of the insider, the person who is promoted from within? Uh, what are their pros and cons? And as well as, is there any for the creator? As well as I am, my, the one that fascinates me the most is the legacy one. You know, how's that passed out? Especially when the person themselves says, well, I don't want to take over the, the business. I don't want to, you know, and yet, they're the key person. Yeah, I think some of the, the key aspects of when you're looking at an insider is what Meredith has already referred to is that they're managing former peers, right? You've just elevated this person up. Maybe some of those around them were also vying for these positions of leadership. And so you have to take this into account. Uh, they know you a bit. They know your strengths as well as your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, they even know that source of credibility that they say, hey, weren't you the one who used to, you know, slough off at work and now you're telling us to do this? Mm. So managing them is an important part of, uh, you know, learning to succeed in this path. And the thing is, we talked to lots of different leaders that we outlined in the book who gave their strategies for dealing with this. And they ranged from everything to creating personal rules. Like we, one leader was telling us, well, I just had to say no more happy hours. You know, I had to set some boundaries. Uh, others said it was the hardest thing I had to do, but I had to 
remove some of my friends from my orbit. Like I had to either shift them into other responsibilities within the organization or outright have a hard conversation with them saying, look, this is the way the organization is going. I am the one responsible for it at this point. And you either have to get on board or you have to find another place where you can do what you want to do, right? So it's very difficult on the, the human side But this mirrors a lot of other things going on at the same time. Like insiders have to be adapting their metrics. You know, Mm. there's that that old uh, book by Marshall Goldsmith that you probably have heard of where it says, what got you here won't get you there. So you can have all these metrics for yourself and for the organization in terms of what is it that got me here? What are the things that are successful or what is successful for the organization? But that's not the same as what it will take for you as a leader and the organization to hit that next level. So mm-hmm. understanding, you know, what is measured is what the organization often becomes. It get, you know, it gets rewarded within the organization. It gets put into the reports and you have to make sure that you're identifying the things that actually correspond not only to the value of the organization for its customers and stakeholders, but also the value for yourself so that you can succeed in the way that you want to. The other piece that I would just add to that managing former peers, because that is such a key challenge for the promoted path is when you think about it, okay, so I'm competing with a bunch of peers for who's going to get that next job. And then I'm, I'm selected to be in that role. The natural state would be to be very concerned about what a great job I'm doing, right? I'm going to be so focused on doing the best possible job that I can um, in leading up developing relationships with new peers, right? Learning my new responsibilities. Now, the people that weren't promoted, what they're starting to think about is very different. They're Mm. thinking, do I want to work for her anymore, Mm. right? Mm. Is she going to help? You know, she's now a potential career blocker, right? That job's not going to open for a long time. Do I really want to stick around? What's in it for me to work for her? And so one of the things that that, um, one of the tools tools that Mark and I provide is, you know, going through this very quick talent review of your team and saying, who are the people that I need to keep on my team in order for this team to stay successful? And, you know, day one, it's about having those conversations about them and their career and why they should stick around and what you're going to be providing for them to help them to continue to grow and learn. Wow, that's before you were elevated, you had these weekend parties or with their house or dinners and things like that. And now you're their boss. Yeah. And now the relationship changes. Right. Wow. You know, and uh, so is there a, a way or is there any kind of skill base training for this person who's the insider that's able to deal with relationships? Um, I know that it's one of the toughest decisions to make when you are now the head of your peers and you have to make some tough decisions of, as far as cutting somebody who's not going to go along with the mission. You yeah. know, is there training out there for a person like that? I mean, one, one form of training, I'll just tell my colleagues business here. I mean, executive coaching is huge. I mean, we've come a long way in understanding what it is that we can do for executives and leaders as they you know, think about their own careers as well as for the good of the organization. So there are lots of formal training programs. There's lots of academic programs, but increasingly uh, good leaders are finding that having someone who can objectively outside the organization sort of uh, perform as a, a sounding board, maybe give some counsel or advice or examples from others, you know, whether it's from their, uh, you know, other readings from, from tools, from the research literature even. But as Meredith would pointed out, we have tools in the book, right? Processes mm-hmm. and sort of easy fill out on paper tools. The whole last chapter of the book, in fact, is filled with these and we refer to them throughout. So we don't want to just say, hey, this is what's going on. Here's some strategies that others use without also adding in. And here's what you can do for yourself. So a lot of the book is pointed toward that end. In the middle, I looked at the beginning and I saw those tools and I was excited about that. Uh, I just For our viewers, how do they tap into coaching? How would they get involved in that? And who do they contact? And I think, you know, LinkedIn is a great 
is a great way just to connect with um, with all different types of executive coaches. Um, there is an organization for certified coaches called the International Coach Federation, mm -hmm. um, and so you know there you can um, use the directory for you know coaches at different levels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm an executive coach. I'm happy to serve as a resource for folks in terms of, um, you know, helping them to, to connect them with the right type of coach. There are coaches that specialize in different leadership challenges as well as different industries as well. Many of our viewers are leaders of organization globally. And uh, what are some effective ways, and I think we heard it a little bit about it, uh, to support employees who are moving up in the corporate ladder? But I think the start with is you want to recognize if you're saying moving up, that implies one kind of organization within, right? So that's that insider promoted. But you could also be concerned for employees that you know will go to other organizations. Um, so I would start with understanding the, the path itself and what the different opportunities are. There are also appointees, right? And, and this is what we call the proxy path because appointees will get appointed to board positions or high level government positions. And that also comprises a way that people can advance their career and their leadership success. So the first step is probably recognizing what the path is and then looking around and saying, what is going on in this path that I should be aware of? What are the opportunities and the challenges, as well as what strategies have others tried and, you know, mostly, hopefully have worked, um, or even I can learn from the, the missteps of others as well. So Understanding that, you know, getting a sense of the context and reading about the past, not just your own, but what others have experienced, I think is really important. And, and for an example of that, I'll expand in your earlier question about the different paths, right? We only really talked about the insider. There's also the outsider who really is challenged with knowing you know, they, they don't know what they should know and they don't know who they should know. Mm. And so they have to figure out how can I come into this culture, understand what they value in this organization and make sure that you're doing it in such a way that you're not stepping on everyone's toes. And as one of our interviewees put it, that you really have to understand where organizations make their bread and butter right? What is it that creates their value and how does the organization do that? And then plug yourself into that. I think that's advice that can go for any path. It's going to be, you know, done a little differently. Again, you know, if you're elected, then you have to make sure that you are paying attention to that slice of the population who's actually going to be the tipping point for you to get elected. If you are, uh, you know, a, 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 say a founder of an organization or creator path, then you're going to want to make sure that you pick people who can complement your strengths. And probably early on, you'll need people that you can directly influence so that they buy in and believe. But later, you're going to want to professionalize the management and perhaps be a little bit more metric oriented in terms of what professional expertise you need and what you want them to accomplish. Ooh. So, you know, the advice has to be first understand the context, then understand yourself and how you can fit into it. Understanding it yourself. And if they don't understand themselves, it's going to be very difficult for them to understand the culture uh, and, and maneuver and navigate within that culture. Yeah. Um, again, when we think about the outsider path, usually an organization goes to the outside because that talent doesn't exist internally, right? The, the data shows that people do tend to be more successful promoted from within than coming in from the outside. There are more challenges, right? Cultural fit, adjustment, all, you know, less of a known entity and so many other reasons. And so, you know, the, the organization is going to the outside usually for a specific reason. Um, again, skills, experience, um, uh, you know, um, background, et cetera. And when we think about that, there's also tends to be an element of being some sort of a change agent, right? Mm. Because mm. even when, you're, even when you're bringing in a new expertise, there's something around change there, right? Because that new expertise is going to be looking at the challenges in a new way, right? And what often happens in organizations is the process of recruiting someone from the outside often means, you know, really trying to lure that person into the organization, especially when we're talking about senior level positions. So, 
So the organization, the headhunter, recruiting, you know, they are trying to encourage this person, usually from leaving something else, to come to their organization for something that's unknown for them. And when it comes to being a change agent, a lot of it is like, oh, we love this about you, and we want we want you to bring that to our organization, right? But what often happens is that just because the people who are luring that person into the organization are excited about that change, that doesn't mean the people within the organization mm. <laughs> that that individual is going to have to lead and recruit, that they're excited about that change, mm. right? And so there's often a huge disconnect there. And so, you know, we hear a lot of stories about leaders like, you brought me in to do X, but nobody wanted X once I got there. And so I'm going to go somewhere else where that's more appreciated. Mm -hmm. And so going back to your question about, you know, like how can the organization support, um, you know, one of the things that I think the followers, right, the people who are working for that change agent can do is help them to see that context around change better, you know, these are the way that new ideas get sold in this organization effectively. This is the way that ideas are not sold as, as effectively, or here are some of the key influencers that we really need to get on board if we want to initiate that change, right? Now, if the group that that person is inheriting is very resistant to change, it's really, really tough for that person to be successful. And sometimes those teams have to turn around if the commitment is to that new executive, sometimes those teams have quite a bit of turnover because they're not ready for that change. Mm. Um, but anyway, I think I think as followers, you know, we need to be rooting for our leaders. And and you know, as Mark and I said, it's like you kind of they don't know what they don't know. And so much of what those followers can do is clue these people in into the additional aspects of their context that they might not be aware of. What advice would you give a new leader in their leadership role? And you just answered that right there. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is so important, I think, to get the folks involved in, in the context, you know, whether, you know, the mission statement or the vision statement or whichever way they want to word it. Uh, this is what we're about. This is what, how we're going to do it. And you guys have an investment involved in it, you know, and yeah. watch it develop. To your, your family legacy, because you said you're really interested in that. And I agree. It's one of the most fascinating paths of, uh, personally for me, and I think Meredith enjoyed too, because we got to talk to a lot of family leaders who emphasize the point that, you know, they've inherited almost nothing. They were actually given an opportunity to succeed or to fail. And there's a lot of challenges in the family legacy path that probably uh, people aren't aware of, but we can probably all learn from as well. Like one of the things that we heard over and over again was that managing a family business in the second, third or fourth generation and beyond is as much about managing the family relationships as it is the family business mm. because they're intertwined, right? And it works both forward and backward. One of our interviewees uh, liked to tell the story about how whenever they were coming up for a major decision within the organization, they would gaze out the window and look up the hill and to see what their ancestors uh, would think. And you know, when they said, well, what would the folks on the hill think? What they're referring to is the cemetery on the hill <laughs> where their family members you know, were, sure, they were interred there, but they were also a big part of the continuing DNA of that business. And so talking about the idea of how we run it, not just to succeed on the bottom line, but to succeed for the family was really important. Even to the point in which like uh, one of our other executives that we spoke with talked about how she and her brother would trade positions within the organization, whether it's CEO or COO or various other positions, but their salary never changed, mm. right? Because they had agreed that this is how we're going to run our family business. Now, not every family business runs that way. There's a lot of other decisions involved as well. There's difficulties such as the uh, previous generation staying involved even when they're not running the business anymore, right? So you look to them for advice, but sometimes you have to sort of spread your wings. And that can be one of the challenges because you're trying to maintain the family coherence at the same time running a successful business. What do you say to a young man or a young lady who is part of that family business, but they really don't want to be involved anymore. I mean, they just, I, they, they're passing on the baton to them, but I, I, I'm not interested, you know? 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> 100%. And, yeah. and, and, and what we found in our research is that the family businesses that seem to have, you know, best practice around this is that they have a governance structure that mm. addresses those issues, right? Mm -hmm. And that that governance structure um, really does separate what are the needs of the family and what are the needs of the business um, and acknowledges that some family members are still going to be part of the overall family business without being operators of the business. Um, and, and so, you know, what would be my advice to that individual would be maybe they should make a recommendation for their, you know, parents or whomever to do a little bit more reading about, about what is considered better governance of family businesses, which mm -hmm. does in fact um, allow for greater choice. Um, you know, one of the thing, one of the many things that I think Mark and I found so fascinating is how, you know, how the wealth of the business is just treated so differently, you know, than, you know, than the revenue and, you know, the spreadsheets of the business. And so you can be a shareholder of the business as a family member, right, without being an executive in the business. And as a shareholder, you do have, you know, certain rights and responsibilities, um, but that those skill sets are going to be very different um, than the operators. You know, some other important, I think, best practices just from a, um, you know, which would apply to that scenario as well is, is many of the companies would require that for any executive position in their family business, any individual would have had to have experience in another business um, and not only just have held a position, but have been promoted and been successful right, without that family um, preference. And, you know, we certainly believe that that is important for the self-confidence of that individual, for them to, you know, so not only are they learning really important skills and getting new perspective, but also they, they know that they can succeed without, mm. that, without that family bias, right? Mm -hmm. um, which also helps on that credibility theme that we were talking about before, right? Because sometimes their credibility can be questioned and it could be seen as, you know, they're just entitled to those positions. But if they've been successful in another organization, then they can come in with greater credibility as well. And this yeah. is something I see all the time in the classroom as well, right? So I teach uh, primarily MBA students. And a lot of these folks are coming in from family businesses, but with the intention of learning in the academic environment and then taking that and working for other companies, maybe within the same industry, maybe not, maybe others, both to explore their own interests, but also to bring it back to the family business at some point later in their career. And there's reasons for that, because one of the challenges of that family legacy path are that you get too insular and you have a limited perspective perspective and you're simply going by what the family culture is and not necessarily keeping up with the times. Mm. We heard many stories uh, from, from the executives that we spoke to and their own paths and how sometimes they didn't think they wanted to go back to the family business, but ended up going back and being successful. And others who say, you know what, we have a lot of people who leave this business, who are members of the family, and they become our ambassadors uh, to other businesses, because all of a sudden we have family in all kinds of places that ultimately helps us. So there's a lot of ways to be involved as a family member. Thank you both for your insight and your knowledge uh, in this. I, I wish I could just harness your mind into it <laughs> so for myself and grab a hold of it and sit down uh, and grab. Hey, that's why we wrote the book. Hey, you know, hey the look at that. Got, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the book is, is great. The book is great. And uh, how would someone get the book? Um, if a person wanted to purchase the book, how would they get it? Amazon's the easiest way. Amazon.com. And you look up Six Paths to Leadership or, you know, Meredith personally is, is actually even a, an easier name to find than Mark Clark. There's probably more <laughs> Mark Clarks out there. But honestly, um, we have Kindle version, we have a uh, hardcover version, and we, we also have uh, webinars like this where we try to share the information and, and get the word out. We're really more interested in people thinking about the context and taking this into account in their own leadership styles 
uh, then we aren't necessarily selling books. But of course, selling books helps get those ideas out. Yeah. And also, are you guys available to speak to particular groups of leaders or groups of people about leadership paths? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, we'd, we'd love to share ideas, like Mark said. Um, you know, the, we, we chose to make this contribution to the leadership literature because we really do think it matters. And, and we've seen people um, fail without paying enough attention to their context. Um, and, and that was a huge inspiration behind the book. Um, we didn't even get a chance to talk about the appointed path, but, oh. uh, you know, the, the political appointee path in that chapter, we talk about this term called the weebies, which is the career professionals underneath the appointed leaders. Um, weeby means um, we be here before you, we be here after you. Um, <laughs> the, average, the average tenure of a political appointee is only 18 months. Wow. Um, they have to take a very quick approach to knowing what their priorities are and hitting the ground running. Um, and how they treat and interact with those weebies is really essential for, um, for enhancing their, their ability to be successful. And so, um, you know, again, we want to get our ideas out there because we really truly believe in the importance of, um, of leadership effectiveness um, to, you know, to our world um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. across industries, across sectors. And, um, and so we'd love to, to have opportunities to share them. And the way the book is organized, you know, is right along those six paths. The, the first chapter gives you the themes and all the commonalities. The, the second chapter, all, all the way um, through the, the next five, then would give the path itself, the challenges, the opportunities, strategies, and it's full of quotes and ideas that we got from the interviews with executives and leaders and politicians. I wish I was the fly on the wall, you know, to have seen this and just just to get to hear folks like that. Again, thank you both for your uh, taking time out of your busy schedule and just share with our viewers what the sixth path of leadership is, is it is exciting. I encourage every one of our listeners to please purchase this book. You guys who are developing in leadership and learning about leadership development, please get this. It's a great guide. Uh, it'll help you. And again, thank you for tuning in to Omega Author Talks. <laughs>